Hello, I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. I'm pleased to welcome to our program today two guests, John Robertson and Jaime Estades. John Robertson is a full-time lecturer at the Columbia School of Social Work, where he teaches courses on social welfare policy and advocacy, research methodology, and human behavior. His interests include community development and organization, employment and family issues, and treatment for people struggling with substance abuse. He is involved in community social work practice in Brooklyn's Bushwick neighborhood and has worked and published on several national policy research initiatives related to poor families, their employment, family formation, and the receipt of public assistance. Dr. Robertson holds a BA in economics from St. John's College, University of Manitoba, an MSW from Rutgers University, and a PhD in labor economics and social policy from the Columbia School of Social Work. Jaime Estades, a former Columbia University Revson Fellow, earned a Juris Doctor at the City University of New York School of Law and a Master's in Social Work at the Hunter College Graduate School of Social Work. In addition to teaching at CSSW, Mr. Estades is an adjunct professor of social welfare policy at the Rutgers Graduate School of Social Work and has also taught social justice and public policy at Fordham's Graduate School of Social Services. Mr. Estades has worked for decades on issues related to education, immigration, housing, voter registration, and family entitlement issues. He is the founder of the Latino Leadership Institute a nonpartisan, not-for-profit corporation affiliated with the City University of New York, which has trained thousands of individuals on the fundamentals of campaign management and public policy. Mr. Estades is also a frequent invited commentator on political and policy issues for a range of media outlets and was an executive producer of the documentary film based on the 2016 presidential election um, entitled The November Surprise, shown at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival. Dr. Robertson and Mr. Estades, welcome to Social Impact Live. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so let's just dive in. What happened last night in Iowa? Well, the Iowa caucuses are a way in which um, a certain group of privileged white people get to decide or set the tone on who is uh, going to be uh, the candidates for president. So um, their system didn't work, uh, but it's a system that doesn't work for the country. It particularly doesn't work for the people that social workers serve. Mr. Status? Well, basically the, the Iowa caucus uh, has this original scene that comes back to the, goes back to the 19th century. Uh, the way that the caucus is set up is completely anti-democratic, hmm. and it has been anti-democratic throughout almost uh, a century and a half. And yesterday was basically the crystallization of that type of uh, inability of the caucus to basically produce uh, a vote that is uh, representative of the people. Mm -hmm. Now, Iowa is basically a white state. It's 96 percent white. Mm -hmm. The percentage is 4 lat four percent Latino, 3 percent African American, 1 percent others. Uh, but even discriminate against working class whites. Mm -hmm. For example, you have to be there at a certain time during the evening, and if you are not there at that time, uh, then you cannot participate. Mm. Women who have children cannot participate unless they can get a babysitter, but the babysitter can also <laughs> can participate yeah. and vote, but won't be able to do that because yeah. of babysitting. Yeah. People who work in shifts cannot do it because they cannot be at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, the elderly is very difficult. You have to spend at least minimum three hours inside the caucus mm -hmm. in order to uh, vote. And all these things prevent people from voting. Mm. And they have been preventing that for more than a century and a half. Yeah. So it's completely anti-democratic. And even when the process inside, you mm. can say that it's democratic in the sense that there is a conversation, there is a dialogue. Uh, who cares about that if people yeah. cannot come and participate? Uh, well, I have to say, I find this 
rather distressing um, to think that, uh, I mean, we've been looking forward to this first caucus, right, and, and uh, um, starting the process and, and, and uh, about uh, uh, leading up to the presidential uh, election in the fall. And, uh, um, and now, I mean, we're here today to talk about uh, voter mobilization, right, turn out the vote and so on. And, and it seems that, well, for what? It sounds like the whole system's broken here. Well, when you have a system that has suppressed the vote um, amongst people that don't have power in the society, mm. basically for 200 years, and voter suppression is not just an issue in the South or in Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most New Yorkers don't know there are th two primaries in New York this year and that the New York State Legislature will be determined at a primary in June. Mm -hmm. That's a secret primary that the Democratic Party keeps secret so that uh, the people we serve as social workers are not going to have any voice in, in the people that are elected to mm. the New York State Legislature. And that's why it's so critical that we as social workers engage in, get it, in making it possible, creating paths so that the voices of the people we serve can be heard in this process. Okay. The only way change is going to happen is the people making the change. Okay, so currently, what's our agenda as social workers uh, now as far as um, voter mobilization is concerned and so on? I know there are national initiatives and so on that you're involved with, and um, Dr. Robertson, so um, would you care to speak uh, to that? So f for about 40 years now, starting with Richard Cloward, we've had the, an effort to have social workers make it their business to engage people we serve and help them find their way to the polls. Mm. And that includes dealing with the kind of questions you're asking with, the, the, the disheartened, the dispirited feeling that comes from watching this corrupt system mm. function. Yeah. Um, but, but by engaging people, having people talk to one another, having people understand the way the system goes, mm -hmm. and understanding that the liberation movements in, in America have always depended upon the actions of ordinary people mm -hmm. taking actions, yeah. then um, social workers can build the vote amongst mm -hmm. the people we serve and can support people in getting to the polls mm -hmm. uh, and to build a stronger election. Mr. Stadis, uh, could you comment on, well, f based on your own experience working with people in the community who might feel disenfranchised, um, um, not invested in participating uh, in voting and, and so on, um, what it's been like and, and, and are we doing the right things um, in order to, to get people involved? Well, unfortunately, based on the Constitution of the United States, mm this country has never done the right thing when it comes to voting. Mm. The history of voting in the United States can be summarized in two words, which is voter suppression. Uh, even in the Constitution of the United States, the word right to vote didn't exist until the 14th Amendment. Mm. And that right to vote is given to the states. Mm -hmm. For example, there are 3,000 ways of voting in the United States, different ways of voting. Mm -hmm. For example, the Iowa caucus, in Iowa they decided to have caucus. They can do whatever they want in terms of voting. And throughout the United States, how you allocate uh, electoral colleges mm -hmm. is allocated differently. Mm -hmm. uh, in Nebraska, they have only two electoral colleges and they uh, divide the, the, the electoral colleges mm -hmm. uh, according to to the vote, but they, they can also say, you know, one is going to be for the Democrats, one is going to be for the Democrats. Mm. Everything in terms of the right to vote belongs to the states. Mm. There is no right to vote at the federal level. Okay. When we talk about presidential elections, there is no right to vote. And mm. that was being, that has been said in many cases. The, the last case was uh, Bush versus Gore in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, Scalia basically stated very clearly that uh, there is no right to vote. Mm. If there had been a right to vote at the federal level, mm. then they would have counted. Mm -hmm. So you need to basically allow the states to determine how it's going to be, and that's what the state of Florida did. Mm. So it has been a, a, a flaw system mm. since the inception of the Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, and the reflection of that constitution is, is still valid. For example, electoral colleges, yeah. majority of the vote doesn't count. Yeah. 
because the founders, they basically wanted mm. to create a system that favored the class. Mm -hmm. There was 55 white men, mm. wealthy white men in the Constitution of mm. the United States, and they distrusted mm -hmm. the majority. Mm. Therefore, they didn't include the word democracy, mm. but republic instead of democracy. Yeah. Well, you know, and before I go on, I just want to remind uh, our viewers that we do reserve the last 10 minutes for question and answers So, um, if uh, for our uh, guests. So if you have any questions, please write them in and uh, we'll, we'll be uh, passing them along at the, uh, in the last part of the program. So, um, so do we need to work? I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, there's activism at the grassroots level maybe state and local elections and things like that, and trying to sort of get a sense of, you know, uh, the, the voice of, of people who've been disenfranchised. But you're suggesting that policy really needs to take place, a, a change at a higher level before any of that matters? I mean, uh, definitely. There has to be an amendment to the Constitution, hmm. uh, a couple of amendments. Hmm. Uh, one has to do in terms of the electoral colleges. Yeah. Uh, one, another one has to do in terms of making uh, accessible voting. For example, it doesn't happen what happened last night in mm -hmm. Iowa, that it can, uh, a federal law that basically makes sure that people can vote two weeks before the election. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to restitute the uh, Voting Rights Act that was basically uh, diminished mm -hmm. in power by a decision by the current Supreme, Supreme Court, mm. uh, Roberts was the, uh, the author of the opinion that basically uh, eliminated Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. uh, that basically created the criteria that has to be used in order to make sure that uh, in the states that the Voting Rights Act specified, mostly in the South, mm. that they, any change that they made had to be approved by the Department of Justice or a court, an appeal court in, in Washington. Okay. That was eliminated. Mm. And now what we see is a wave of border repression mm. throughout the United States that is going to increase. Mm. We're going back to reconst after Reconstruction, mm. Jim Crow laws in terms of body. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Robertson, um, I wonder if you have some thoughts about um, this issue of, of voter suppression and, again, um, what is it that we can do as social workers as part of, you know, our daily practice, the work that we're doing, agencies and so on, that um, in some way can, can turn the conversation back to these issues? Because, I, I mean, we're sort of caught in this conundrum, right? Um, often we feel that as social workers and as professionals, right, um, we do want to practice a, a sort of nonpartisan kind of uh, approach and, and sort of promoting democracy, yes, that sounds great, but it doesn't seem to be mobilizing people um, as much as sort of trying to fight injustice like voter suppression. So how do you see this sort of working into our... <clears throat> well, um, we're in the midst of yeah. a reform of the, of the uh, Electoral College. Mm -hmm. And a, a, number of, a number of states now have passed a constitutional amendment oh. that will kick in when it hits a, a critical number mm. and we will, we will reform. Mm. And that's happening because state by state by state, mm -hmm. people are organizing and fighting. Yeah. Um, the, the most important thing that happens in government every year is the passing of budgets. Mm. So Medicare, food stamps, housing policy, uh, school funding, that's all passing in budgets. Mm -hmm. And the way in which um, that gets shifted has to do with the nuances of who gets elected. Mm -hmm. There are no saints in this business. There's no, <laughs> nobody who you're, there's very few full heroes, but there are people who will vote for, will, will vote to dismantle Medicaid, mm. and there are people who will vote to strengthen it. Right. And from a social work point of view, those things really matter, and mm. they really matter to the people we, we serve. Right. And, and so finding a way that that is shifting the vote election by election um, is, is something that we can do. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the system-wide reforms, yes, we'll need them, but system-wide reform in the United States 
is a generational thing. Mm. Um, the yearly budget is the yearly budget, mm -hmm. and it has enormous impact on, on, on the families and mm -hmm. the people we serve. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it seems that from 2016 to 2018, there has been some change in terms of people's uh, engagement with uh, the political process and voting. And, um, you know, Iowa aside, um, I think we're going to see, um, well, what do you think we're going to see um, in the coming uh, six months, eight months, uh, leading up to November? Well, based on the most recent Supreme Court decisions, mm -hmm. we have Citizens United that was decided right after Obama became president of the United States mm -hmm. that uh, basically says that corporations now are people mm -hmm. and therefore that they can put as much money as they want to in elections without having to report the monies mm -hmm. that they are uh, creating, that they are donating to a PAC, to a political action committee, and that they basically can do as much as they want without any type of regulation. It's like if I hmm. want to support a candidate and I can put, I have a First Amendment right hmm. to put all my money behind a candidate as long as I don't give it to the candidate mm -hmm. and I create my own political action committee. Mm -hmm. So now they have a First Amendment right like people, corporations, mm -hmm. in which they can put as much money as they want in order to support a candidate as long as they don't give it directly to the candidate. Mm -hmm. So everything has changed in Citizens United. So it makes things more difficult in the sense that uh, they have a bigger bullhorn now mm -hmm. than a normal person. Okay. And then we have the Shelby decision that I just spoke about, the Voting Rights Act, that was also diminished mm -hmm. right after Obama mm -hmm. uh, became uh, president of the United States. And now we have another decision, which is the Rucho decision, Rucho versus uh, the Common Sense, uh, that basically says that now you can gerrymander districts mm -hmm. in a partisan way and according to Roberts, you can do that uh, because that is part of the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, voting is supposed to be a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. Fundamental rights are the highest rights in yeah. terms of the Constitution. Yeah. But uh, Roberts has said that you cannot discriminate in terms of race. That's an old case mm -hmm. that basically dealt with that. But in terms of partisanship, you can create districts according to the wishes of the party in power at the state. Mm. So now with Trump in power, what I see is that everything is going to increase. The suppression, the suppression that we're going to have, border suppression in 2020, mm -hmm. is going to be maybe the biggest of the last two centuries, mm -hmm. excluding the 19th century. Now, on John's point, that doesn't mean that we cannot try to fight that and organize. Mm -hmm. That's basically John's project that I'm, I'm proud to be working with him mm -hmm. uh, on this in terms of trying to educate people about those problems, but also about what we can do in order to organize uh, the vote and fight against those obstacles that they are putting. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, so if you're a New Yorker, mm -hmm. we have a big change in the New York State Legislature. Therefore, we have a bail reform law. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, expansions of a variety of, of public service programs mm -hmm. because, and that happened because people with a vision fought for years yeah. to push back and get a full change the structure of the New York State Legislature. Mm -hmm. This year, we're going to have another New York State Legislature election. Um, we're also going to have a full congressional election. Mm -hmm. um, and so who controls the Senate, who controls the House, yeah. is very much at play this year. And that has to do with how we invest in these elections. Mm -hmm. And um, people are in different places. Next year, we'll be all the city council and the mayor mm -hmm. we're going to be electing for. And these bread and butter issues um, affect how much p social workers get paid, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of services we can offer our clients, mm -hmm. and and it puts us in a position where we can get a New York State to write an amendment uh, to the Constitution that will push ending voter suppression. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that the House, and people in the House, there'll be enough votes in the House to write an amendment and to take that long-term fight on. Okay, all right, um, well, Let's see, uh, we can turn to a question from our viewing, viewing audience. If there were no voter suppression, 
which of the current or recent Democratic hopefuls do you think would become the party's candidate for 2020? Um, I don't know if you have a crystal ball <laughs> handy. Um, what do you, the relationship to uh, voter suppression and uh, does that particularly favor any one candidate or well, kind of candidate? Uh, it, it favors candidates that can raise a lot of money. Mm. You know, we're talking about election campaigns. People are raising $20 million a month yeah. to run for public office so that they can access publicly owned media, mm. the radio waves, the television waves, the, 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 the waves on which social media flow. Right. Um, that's all part of making sure that the electoral system is controlled mm. by people with money. Yeah. And so uh, if we had a system where that kind of money was an influence in the system, mm. we might see quite a different set of candidates running. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's been widely remarked upon how, as we've proceeded through the debates, right, the, the um, Democratic uh, presidential candidates have become progressively wider, right, and, and uh, um, to where we are now. But uh, again, I, you know, I, that's disheartening. Um, and, and, and turning people off. So how do we, how do we, how do we fight that, that dynamic? Or, I mean, well, the, the danger is yeah. that um, that people become so turned off that we get another term of Donald Trump, mm. and we get another term of Republican control of the Senate. Mm. And that's the that's what they're hoping for, that people become so turned off that that they main that Mitch McConnell remains um, the Senate Majority Leader. Mm. Um, so it's complicated, and we're not going to see ourselves. We have to fight to get this electoral system, as Jaime is saying, into mm. something that looks like a democratic system. But that we have to do by pushing on where we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question. Are there models elsewhere in the world for accessible democratic elections that we could push for here? Well, the, the United States became the first model uh, in history. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, election, but it was not a democratic uh, system. I think that the United States tends to romanticize the Constitution and also uh, the electoral process in the United States. The mm -hmm. fact that at the federal level, the majority of the vote doesn't count, uh, doesn't make the system democratic. Mm -hmm. You cannot have someone winning an election by three million votes and then say that you didn't win the election because you didn't win certain states. Mm -hmm. That basically those states are very small states uh, or medium states, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, Wisconsin. Uh, so those are the ones that state that basically gave mm -hmm. Trump the, the election. Mm -hmm. So it's, it has never been a democratic process. The founders basically clearly stated that it wasn't going to be democratic. They created a republic. And that was basically to help the South during those times to remain in control. The system that we have in the United States, mm -hmm. to summarize it, mm -hmm. is a system that was agreed with slave owners right. to this day. There are places in the world where yeah. money is not allowed in elections, yeah. mm -hmm. public money. Uh, if, you, if you look around the world, throughout Europe, yeah. um, in, in Japan, mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in South Korea, mm. there isn't the access to this kind of the control of money. Mm. It doesn't mean they've got a perfect system, but it's not swung to the degree that ours is. Mm. And therefore, there's a more open system, mm -hmm. and you have higher levels of participation in right. the system. Yeah, but money isn't the only factor. I mean, you know, we've had people like Ross Perot in the past and so on who've used their own money, and this year I, I know that there are you know, candidates um, who are uh, using their billions, right, um, to... Uh, support their presidential campaigns and so on. So it's, but it's more than money, I mean, isn't it? Well, it was more than uh, money when Ross Perot ran, mm. because then you depended on organizations. There were caps in terms of the contributions that people 
uh, could make, and there are still caps in terms of the contribution okay. that people can make to the campaigns. But Citizens United didn't exist then. Mm. That means that now corporations uh, can put a, a, all the amount of money that they, and they put millions, uh, billions of dollars. Mm. So every, the, the, the game has changed. Mm -hmm. For example, the fact that there are not that many people of color are running, even when they want to run, mm. but they cannot participate in debates is basically because they cannot reach a certain amount of monies that can make them viable. Mm. For but the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, just changed the, the rules last week, yeah. doing completely the opposite. The Democratic National Committee is giving more access to people like, uh, uh, what uh, I forgot, uh, uh, Bloomberg mm. and, and, and others, to be part of debates if they wish to, because they have the amount of monies that they needed in right. order to participate. Right. But that doesn't happen. Didn't happen to Cory Booker and right. and, and others. So you you, you you can see that the parties are now becoming franchises. Mm. And and the money. It's not just money. Yeah. It's the intentionality of money. Mm. The by. By pushing the system to require this kind of fundraising, yeah. um, they're pushing everybody to spend their time raising money mm -hmm. and not not that, talking to the and people and not legislating. Yeah. yeah. So, but but the issue of franchises, uh, I think, is important because now what you see is that you have people with money and they use the banners of the parties mm -hmm. as a franchise, like McDonald's and Burger King, and they get there, they invest their monies. Yeah. For example, Trump, he was a Democrat a long time ago, then he became a Republican, and then he uh, ran under the banner of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. You have Ocasio, a socialist. Mm -hmm. You have uh, Sanders, a socialist. Mm -hmm. They were never part of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. But now they are forced to find a banner that, is being prom that has been promoted for more than two centuries in mm -hmm. this country mm -hmm. in order for them to be accepted. Mm -hmm. So you, you have now everybody's getting one of the, of the, of the parties and they're using them as a franchise mm -hmm. in which they invest their resources, their monies in order to I, run for office. Yeah, but I, what I don't, to what end though? It just seems that, I mean, you called it a game and, and maybe the purpose of any game is to identify a winner, right? And and it seems like winning is the the object. We don't we don't have ideals. We don't have, you know, a goal that sort of represents a standard, right? That that we're well, that the it, way that dem democracy and that whole, you know, sort of uh, uh, um, concept entails, right? So uh, politics is about power. It's about power. It's right? about power. People. There are people in the process that have ideals. Mm. And if you listen to some of the people that are running, there are some that have ideals. Yeah. There are some that have no ideals at all. Yeah. There's some whose only ideal is me. Mm. Um, but the, the issue of the power is not tied yeah. to the issue of the ideal. Yeah. Okay. And, and so if, if we have a system that biases money mm. and, and excludes big chunks of the citizenship mm -hmm. from accessing the ballot, yeah. you're going to end up with power being given to a group of people that have a particular worldview. Yeah. Now, yeah. what we're seeing is that every election mm -hmm. in synthesis, mm -hmm. in synthesis, is an election between regulation of the market versus the deregulation of the market. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the Republican Party, complete lace affair. Mm -hmm complete social Darwinism together with that. Mm. And then you have the Democratic Party that believes in some regulation. Mm -hmm. So what you see is this power that John is talking about, but is based on two camps. But even the Democratic Party is not part of the idea that we need to regulate the market even more. That's why mm -hmm. the Democratic Party has a problem in having Sanders as the representative of the Democratic Party mm. in the election because he believed in a larger regulation yeah. of the market. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we have two more questions and we're pretty much running out of time, but we may run over for a few minutes. Um, can Professor Roberts and Professor Estades speak to the influence of the media and foreign influence? And what are ways we can use grassroots organizing and other types of influence to address this? Right. Yeah. So. Um, 
Well, money and media is just tied together. Mm. The foreign influence is is uh, has to do with the non-regulation of the uh, of the uh, social media world. We and and it's not regulated because it benefits a certain group of people with a certain kind of power. Yeah. Um, but one, if if social workers aren't organizing, if we're not part of and believing in the people we work with and serve mm -hmm. enough to believe that we need to uh, organize for the values that we change, mm -hmm. we'll watch it happen. Mm -hmm. But we can stand back, and there's history in this country of movements mm -hmm. that have uh, the labor movement, the the civil rights movement, the you know, um, the, the, to some extent the ecology movement mm -hmm. right now that are pushing really hard, and and are are making a difference. And, yeah, and have succeeded. Right. Yeah. Um, let me just to get in the last question. It all uh, just feels so demoralizing, um, as I've suggested, because the United States has been quote bought out. Uh, and the parties of greed have taken over in Congress via the lobbyists and in the elections via corporations and other moneyed interests. In that sense, it may be rational for people who feel disenfranchised not to vote. After all, even uh, privileged people feel that way. How do you propose concretely to have social workers uh, get people who feel marginalized and to the polls this year? Um, well, I basically, the, the, the model that uh, we have begun with social workers mm. that now is led by John here at Columbia, uh, that's the, the right model. Uh, but focusing also on voter suppression because that's the, the enemy. Okay. We can do voter registration. Yeah. We can do get out the vote. We're going to have a workshop here mm. at Columbia uh, next Monday in which we're going to be talking about uh, the history of voter suppression, but then we're going to have two experts that basically are going to be talking about how to create a proper message mm. in order to bring people out. And then another one is going to be talking about how to get out the vote in mm -hmm. big numbers from the perspective of 501c3s, nonprofit organizations that have the ability to do that because they have the membership, but they also have structures in which the Get Out the Bold campaign yeah. can be uh, inserted. Okay, and uh, um, Professor Robertson, if you want to just share a little bit of information well, about this event next Monday, is it? I imagine this is posted it's on, posted, the, on yeah, the site sure. right now, but Monday night from 6 to 8.30, there's continuing education hours, mm -hmm. and it, it's directly around training the trainers about how, how do we become effective at ag in mm -hmm. agencies about making a difference with this. Okay, all right, great then. Um, well, I think that pretty much winds things up for now. Um, <laughs> there's a lot more I think that needs to be uh, said about this topic and, and what's going to happen in the near future. So uh, perhaps we'll have that opportunity to continue the conversation um, somewhere. So thanks again, um, Professor Robertson, Professor Stades, joining us here on Social Impact Live today. Um, next week, we'll be joined by two uh, alumni of our program, Jenny Crawford and Lorna Woodham, to discuss how social workers can help the formerly incarcerated transition into society. So until then, thanks very much. Have a great week. Bye-bye.